Hello everyone, uh, welcome to the NPTEL course on computational process design. I am Dr. Manoj Kumar Ramteke and along with me my colleague uh, Dr. Hari Prasad Kodamna will be covering this course in the span of 20 to 25 lectures ahead. So in this particular course we are going to use several textbooks. The first textbook which we are going to use regularly is Systematic Methods of Chemical Process Design by Grossman, Bigler and Westerberg. In addition to this, we will be using some other reference books like Conceptual Design of Chemical Processes by Douglas, uh, Chemical Process Design and Integration by Robin Smith, Sustainable Design through Process Integration by uh, Mahmood El Halwagi and uh, we will be using Sustainable Engineering by Bhavik Bakshi. So, if we look at the design problems, design problems are of diverse natures. Uh, particularly, if we take uh, the designing of new spacecraft, uh, usually the new spacecraft design nobody shares to each other, and therefore, designing a new uh, spacecraft usually starts from the scratch. Similarly, if you look at the designing of a smartphone, which usually have a a lifetime of 2 to 3 years. In such cases, the earlier model is improved uh, based on the addition of some additional features. So, uh, compared to these designing problems, if you look at the designing of the refinery or chemical process, it has a different characteristics. Primarily because uh, if the lifetime, if you look at the uh, for the chemical process, it is usually around decades. And during this particular time period, uh, refinery processes are continuously improved or modified. So, uh, if you look at the computational process design, it involves a systematic study of translating the management level decision to the construction of the actual process plan, which can satisfy economic, environmental and social requirements. So, clearly in order to have this. Uh, the concept of several chemical engineering courses are used in this uh, course. So, courses such as fluid mechanics, reaction engineering, mass transfer, heat transfer, process control, numerical method, process optimization, process economics and even sustainability is used in this particular course. So, computational process design primarily leads to the planned construction and operation with following steps. The first step is preliminary design then there is a detailed engineering, then the construction of uh, the plant, after the construction of the plant, then there is a startup and commissioning, after the startup and commissioning, the operation of the plant is performed and then uh, the operation of the plant is continuously improved by adding the modification which is referred as debottlenecking and at the end of the service life, the plant is decommissioned. So, in this case you can see that preliminary design uh, is extremely important because that leads to uh, the, uh, the decisions which are taken in the rest of the life cycle of the plant. So, for a given chemical process, the preliminary design involves developing and evaluating the conceptual flow sheet iteratively. So, there are several uh, alternatives are present and all these alternatives are uh, evaluated in using the cost calculation and also the sustainability aspect. So, in this case, different alternatives are obtained by uh, rationally connecting different uh, equipments in a uh, process flow sheet and then the mass and energy balance is performed and based on that, then the cost is calculated and the, the best flow sheet in terms of the cost uh, as well as the sustainability and also uh, the operational efficiency, uh, the best flow sheet is selected. So, in order to understand this concept, let us take a, a simple illustrative example. So, uh, this example we have taken from this textbook uh, systematic method of chemical process design. So, in this example, uh, a company is producing 75 millions per year of excess ethylene stream, uh, which involves uh, 96 mole percent uh, ethylene, 3 percent propylene and 1 percent methane. So, in this case, uh, the objective is how we can use this excess ethylene produced uh, for a different product which a company can sold and then earn the profit. 
So, the head of the research team suggested that the excess ethylene production can be used for producing the ethanol which can be sold as a product to earn the profit. So, in this case, uh, the research team is suggesting that we can produce ethanol from this excess ethylene and which can be sold. So, again the sales department has suggested to the plant manager that they can sell uh, 1 lakh 50,000 meter cube per year of ethanol. Uh, so, clearly there is a demand. Again, uh, if you look at the typical ethanol production process, a typical ethanol production process uses the ethylene feed which has uh, almost 99.996 percent purity of the ethanol feed to the reactor. But in contrast to this in the given problem, if you look at the uh, purity of the ethanol is 96 percent and then there is a purity of the ethylene is 96 percent whereas the propylene is 3 percent and 1 percent methane. So, the objective here is to evaluate whether the proposed process is viable using a preliminary design or not. So, now uh, for this particular case the main reaction is shown here. So, you can see that the ethylene can react with water and that can produce ethanol. So, typically uh, this particular reaction occurs at the temperature of 535 to 575 Kelvin and at the pressure of around 69 bar. So, uh, in this reaction uh, the conversion single pass conversion is, is around 5 to 7 mole percent and also uh, typically the water to uh, ethylene ratio maintained is around 4 to 1 and this is a non catalytic reaction which is occurring in a homogeneous uh, condition. So, uh, since in this particular case you can see that the conversion is just 5 to 7 percent and uh, because of that large amount of uh, ethylene is remaining unreacted and therefore, uh, water, water to ethylene ratio is taken around 0 0.6 to 1 so that the lower molar flow rates are maintained in the flow sheet. So, uh, in addition to this main reaction there is also another side reaction. In this side reaction what is happening is the ethanol produced is reacting with another ethanol molecule and that produces diethyl ether plus water as a uh, byproduct here ok condensation product. So, uh, if you look at uh, the literature in the literature it is advised that the methane percentage in the feed should be less than 10 percent to avoid cooking because at the given temperature of 535 to 575 Kelvin uh, methane get converted to hydrogen and carbon. Uh, again uh, in the reaction trace amount of croton aldehyde is produced and propylene in the feed reacts with water to produce isopropanol with 0 0.5 to 0.7 percent conversion. So, now uh, we wanted to see uh, whether this impure ethane uh, ethylene feed can be used in this reaction in a viable way or not. So, for this given case you can see that if we rearrange these chemicals in terms of their boiling point. Uh, so, here in this particular schematic you can see that uh, the ethylene which comprised of ethylene stream which comprised of uh, 96 percent ethylene, 3 percent propylene and 1 percent propane is fed to the reactor and along with that water is fed to the reactor and uh, the, the product coming out from the reactor comprises of uh, several components which includes methane, ethylene, propylene, diethyl ether, ethanol, isopropanol, uh, water and crotonaldehyde. Out of these uh, ethylene and water is recycled back whereas, uh, diethyl ether is taken out as a byproduct and ethanol is taken as a product and all other components remaining are the waste products. So, here you can see that in the product uh, line all the products are arranged in a, a decreasing value uh, increasing value of the boiling point. So, here you can see that the croton aldehyde is a solid component which has the melting point around 160 degrees Celsius. So, if you look at the properties of all these components, uh, in this case you can see that the ethylene and uh, methane, uh, these are having the critical temperature of 9.6 degree Celsius and minus 82.1 uh, degree Celsius. So, clearly these two gases are non-condensable at the given ambient temperature and uh, if you look at the other components like uh, 
propylene if we look at the propylene uh, is having the boiling point of minus 47.7 but if we calculate the vapor pressure here so using this antony equation if you calculate the vapor pressure the vapor pressure comes around uh, 15 atmospheric and at this vapor pressure uh, if we wanted to separate propylene as a top product in the distillation unit uh, we have to use a condenser which can go at a very low temperature and because of that the cost required is very high. So, uh, in comparison with this if you wanted to separate let us say diethyl ether as a top product uh, since diethyl ether has a having a boiling point 34.6 which is very close to the ambient temperature uh, even even the naturally available cold water can be used as a cooling agent which is a viable option. So, with this information. Uh, one can see that methane and ethylene can be taken as a non-condensable gases at ambient condition uh, and uh, diethyl ether can be uh, separated in a distillation column. So, in addition to that uh, there are other components like water, ethanol and isopropanol. So, water if you look at water, uh, ethanol and uh, isopropanol these have the boiling points which are significantly higher compared to the ambient temperature. So, they can be separated as a liquid. So, and croton aldehyde is a solid component which is having a melting point of 160 degrees Celsius. So, this data is taken from uh, this book source is mentioned here. So, if you look at the literature for a given uh, reaction if you are using a uh, feed of 99.996 percent pure ethylene then uh, the typical flow sheet given in the literature is shown here. So, here you can see that the ethylene is first compressed to uh, a desired uh, pressure of 69 bar it is mixed with the water and then it is charged to the reactor. In the reactor the temperature is maintained around 535 to 575 Kelvin and uh, in at this condition uh, the conversion of ethylene to uh, ethanol is around 5 to 7 percent and then the product gas coming out from the reactor is then cooled down in a uh, heat exchanger to recover the heat and this cooled feed then uh, uh, separated in a flash unit where uh, the vapor coming out from the flash unit actually comprises of ethylene, diethyl ether and ethanol. This, this gas mixture is then scrubbed uh, in the abs absorber by using the water. So, in this absorber diethyl ether and uh, ethanol uh, from the gas is scrubbed and it is taken out by the water stream and uh, whereas, the, the gas separated here will be comprised of uh, ethylene and contaminants. So, this particular gas is again uh, undergo the splitter where uh, the ethylene is separated whereas, the uh, some amount of ethylene and contaminants are separated as a purge whereas, uh, the ethylene coming out from the splitter is then again uh, compressed in the compressor to uh, increase the pressure up to 69 bar which is same as the pressure required in the reactor and once uh, the gas is pressurized it is mixed with the feed here and the feed is then charged to the reactor. Again uh, in the flash unit the liquid coming out from the flash unit actually comprises of water, diethyl ether, uh, ethanol and croton aldehyde. So, this stream is then mixed with the uh, water stream which is coming from the absorber and this mixed stream is then uh, fed to the distillation unit. In this first distillation unit primarily water and croton aldehyde is separated as a bottom product whereas, the top product is then passed to the second distillation unit where diethyl ether is separated and uh, again the bottom uh, product coming from the distillation unit is then charged to the third distillation unit where primarily the ethanol is separated as a top product and uh, the remaining water is removed as a bottom product. So, this is the typical flow sheet of conversion of uh, uh, ethylene to ethanol when uh, the purity of the ethylene is around 99.996 percent. Now, the question uh, here is how we can modify this particular flow sheet for a given feed condition. So, remember that in a in a case study uh, the given feed has 96 mole percent ethylene, 3 percent propylene and 1 percent methane. So, it is not 99.996 percent pure uh, ethylene. 
so clearly one has to modify this particular flow sheet in order to handle a impure feed so what are the different options uh, or alternatives to do that that is what we are going to look at in this slide so the first option is either we can either we can separate propylene and methane and then uh, in the separator and then uh, the pure ethylene can be charged to the reactor and the same flow sheet can be used um, uh, for the uh, production of the ethanol so that is the option one so in this option however if you look at the if you wanted to separate let's say uh, methane and ethylene so remember the the feed available in the plant has 96 percent ethylene uh, and 1% methane. So, if you wanted to separate this methane from this ethylene, uh, if you look at the boiling point of the methane, so if you look at this particular table, the methane has a boiling point of minus 161.5 and uh, the critical temperature of minus 82.1. So, clearly if I wanted to separate this methane from uh, ethylene, uh, uh, in the distillation process, the methane will come out as a top product, but uh, this top product has to condense and then the uh, reflux has to be uh, charged to the distillation column, isn't it? So, clearly we require to liquefy the methane and which require a uh, heavy duty condenser and which is not a viable option in this case. Since the critical temperature of the methane is minus 81.2 degrees Celsius. So, another option could be uh, we can separate the methane and uh, ethylene by using a membrane separator. So, in this case, uh, the feed has to be charged to the membrane with a high pressure and the methane will be separated at a permeate side. So, clearly uh, there is a chance that uh, some of the ethylene will uh, uh, pass to the permeate side, isn't it? So, there will be a loss of ethylene on a permeate side. So, this option is also uh, involves a cost. So, another option could be uh, we can directly charge this uh, methane to the reactor instead of separating and allow the amount of methane to build up in the reactor up to 10 mole percent as the problem given here you can see that up to 10 mole percent we can use the methane in the feed without coking. So, we can we can feed the methane to the reactor directly instead of separating and we can allow it to build up and and we have to make sure that the the amount of methane in the feed should not go beyond 10 percent and then the methane can be removed from the product stream as a uh, purge is not it. So, and and remember the 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 uh, product coming out from the reactor is then sent to the flash unit. You can see that it is sent to the flash unit where uh, the ethylene diethyl ether and uh, ethanol is sent to the absorber where diethyl ether and ethanol is separated by using the water. So, here you can see that ethylene and uh, methane will be there that methane will be some amount of methane will be separated here in the purge unit in the splitter unit. So, that is the option number two. Similar to methane, there is another impurity which the feed is having uh, and that another impurity is the propylene. Now, if we wanted to remove let us say the propylene uh, uh, before feeding it to the reactor using the separator using let us say a distillation. Uh, so, this is also a costlier uh, option primarily because if you look at the propylene, uh, propylene has the boiling point of minus 47.7 degrees Celsius. So, clearly if you wanted to separate the propylene from the ethylene feed, uh, we have to use the condenser which can liquefy the propylene at minus 47.7 degrees Celsius and which will cost a huge amount of money. So, clearly this is not a viable option. Also, we can look at another option of separating the propylene using membranes. So, if we uh, use the membranes for separating the propylene, in that case, in that case, uh, the propylene uh, will be on the uh, one side and uh, the ethylene will be on the permeate side. So, clearly uh, the ethylene which is coming out from the permeate side will have a, uh, a low pressure and this, this particular stream has to be pressurized to 69 bar which is the required pressure in the reactor. So, clearly the compression cost is going to be very high in this particular option. So, clearly uh, 
separating the propylene is also uh, is not a viable option by using the membranes so in this case we can we can send the propylene also in the reactor similar to methane so if the uh, propylene is sent as a reactant in the reactor in that case uh, it get converted to a isopropanol by rea reacting it with the water and this isopropanol we can separate in the distillation column later the only challenge here is this isopropanol has the boiling point uh, 4 degree higher than the ethanol so which will have some difficulty but still we can separate it so one can see that with respect to uh, the impure feed we have several challenges and there are several alternatives which we have to evaluate iteratively using the flow state synthesis in a systematic manner while ensuring the economic viability and sustainability so if we look at the flow state synthesis so flow state synthesis is the process of designing and optimizing a schematic representation of a chemical process uh, process design is a critical aspect of chemical engineering shaping the efficiency and economic viability of the processes it is essential for mapping out the entire process and identifying the optimization opportunity so you can see that any process any chemical process can be generically represented using the process flow diagram as shown here in this slide so uh, raw material can be charged to the reactor feed preparation and from here the reactant is then charged to the reactor from reactor uh, then uh, the product coming out from the reactor is then uh, prepared for the separation and this uh, product stream is then passed to the separator where the products are separated and uh, some of the products then again can react in the reactor uh, which are again separated in the subsequent steps and some of the reactants which are uh, removed in the separator are recycled back to the feed so if you look at if you look at this particular generic uh, flow diagram we can map the given flow sheet in the generic flow diagram as well so you can see that in this case ethylene and water so here ethylene is first compressed and they are mixed so all these initial feed preparation unit we can consider these so you can see that reactor feed preparation units in this case will be uh, compressor and mixer once that is done the mixer is then charged to the reactor from the reactor then uh, the hot product stream is exchanging heat with the heat exchanger so you can see that the separator feed preparation unit in this case will be a heat exchanger uh, or even the flash drum so flash unit okay so uh, and and subsequent separators will be the distillation units from where the products will be taken out and the unreactant uh, unreacted ethylene and water can be recycled back so if you look at the process synthesis design uh, so uh, uh, the the typical uh, block diagram one can have is the raw material is coming into the process flow sheet and the products are coming out so process flow sheet synthesis actually is nothing but the method to determine a process flow sheet that satisfies all product operational and other requirements so a uh, flow sheet typically includes symbols and representation of the equipment pipes valves instruments and material to illustrate how a process operates the primary purpose of the flow sheets is to provide a visual framework for understanding the process optimizing it and facilitating the communication among the team members again the flow sheets are used in various industries such as chemical plants oil refineries and food processing units so we will be looking at how we can generate the uh, preliminary flow sheets and these pre preliminary flow sheets we can refine uh, iteratively by using the alternatives available so uh, while while obtaining the flow sheets the key objective that need to be satisfied are optimization of the process so which uh, whenever we are generating the flow sheets we aim to optimize the entire process to maximize the efficiency and the performance another uh, key objective which is used while uh, generating the flow sheets is the cost minimization so we wanted to minimize both capital and the operating cost associated with the process uh, the another uh, objective which uh, is considered while generating the uh, flow sheets are the resource efficiency so we wanted to use the energy raw material and time judiciously uh, 
uh, while generating the process flow sheets. We also wanted to maintain the product quality and yield improvement and uh, while maintaining the safety standards. Also environmental impact reduction uh, is required. So we uh, aim to reduce the environmental footprint including the waste generation and emission. So this, this, this particular aspect is extremely important in uh, current scenario where uh, the, the process flow sheets are not only generated only based on the economic viability but also the sustainability in terms of the environmental protection as well as the societal requirement. So the last important uh, objective that need to be satisfied while generating the uh, process flow sheet is flexibility and adaptability. So clearly you can see that if you see the timeline of uh, refineries or process plant that spans for decades. So uh, clearly the process should be uh, designed in such a way that it can adapt the changing conditions and market demand. So if you look at the basic steps involved in flow sheet synthesis, uh, so there are eight different steps involved. Uh, so first step is to collect the data and analysis. So we can collect the experimental data, process specification and material properties. So depending on the management decision, uh, uh, based on the management decision, we can, we can collect the experimental data and the process specification from the literature, from uh, different encyclopedias or from different online resources. And uh, based on that, uh, then, then we can outline the uh, process unit operations and their connections in the flow sheet. So based on that the preliminary flow sheet is made. Uh, again in this, in this uh, the, we have to select the equipments. So we, we can select the equipment for each unit operation considering the capacity and the efficiency. Once this preliminary flow sheet is generated then we can do a material and energy balance uh, and uh, based on the material and energy balance <coughs> then we can calculate the cost for this preliminary flow sheet. Once this preliminary flow sheet is generated, this preliminary flow sheet is then refined by using the different simulation softwares. Again, again we can iteratively modify these preliminary flow sheets based on the different options available, uh, alternatives available and once all these steps are done, finally we conclude with uh, the development of final optimized flow sheets that align with the project objectives. So these are the eight different steps involved in the uh, in the evolution of the flow sheet synthesis. So uh, let us look at uh, what are the different alternatives present and how uh, in the context of uh, the given illustrative example. So again as I said that the preliminary design is extremely important primarily because even though the cost involved in the preliminary design is uh, around 50 to 20 percent of the total cost. However, it has the impact on the remaining 80 percent of the cost which is occurring over the lifetime of the, uh, the uh, process. So here you can see that whatever the decision we make in the preliminary design has a significant role in shaping the uh, operation of the, uh, the process. For instance, very often if we do uh, the, uh, if we do the uh, preliminary design in a in a uh, <coughs> uh, non-optimized manner, it may possible that the obtained design is giving you a bad performance, but actually uh, the, the, the given uh, option or a given decision management decision may be actually beneficial. Okay. Sometimes, sometimes the design is such that every time the plant has to revamp or modify in order to remain competitive. So all these preliminary design decisions have an impact throughout the lifetime of the process. So again, uh, let us look at the different alternatives, those are possible for the uh, given illustrative example. So this is the same illustrative example where ethanol is produced from ethylene. So uh, in this case, in this case, uh, uh, you can see that this particular flow sheet we can represent in a simpler way uh, by aggregating the equipment. So you, here you can see that all fluid preparation equipment we can aggregate in one block. Uh, then then the reactor is aggregated in one block and all the separate separation units are aggregated in the, the last block. So these three blocks are representing the entire process. Such, such simpler uh, representation very often is used to communicate the information concisely to, to the team members. Again, this, this 
equipment aggregation can further be simplified only in terms of one block so here you can see that the complete process is shown where the inputs are there and there are certain outputs are there so now let's look at what are the different alternatives present in the given flow sheet so uh, for the same uh, ethanol production flow sheet uh, remember that we can either separate the uh, uh, propylene and methane from the feed and then charge the pure uh, ethylene to the reactor so this is the alternative one where you can see that the ethylene propylene and methane feed is given to the separator where the propylene and methane is separated and the pure ethylene is then charged to the reactor and in this reactor then water is added and the reaction is occurring and then then uh, uh, the product coming out from the reaction will be comprising of ethylene diethyl ether ethanol water cotonaldehyde and uh, from this mixture uh, we can get the ethanol as a product we can get the ethyl ether as a by product we can we can recycle ethylene and water back to the uh, reactor and and croton aldehyde which is a solid component which is separated here so this is one alternative of course in a similar manner there are different possible alternatives another such alternative is uh, instead of instead of separating the propylene and methane uh, before the reaction uh, we are directly feeding the propylene and uh, methane along with the ethylene to the react reactor so here you can see that the product stream will be comprising of methane ethylene propylene diethyl ether ethanol water crotonaldehyde so clearly we have to separate crotonaldehyde propylene uh, methane isopropanol here and uh, diethyl ether will be taken as a by product ethanol will be taken as a product and then ethylene and water will be recycled back to the reactor so these are the two alternatives we have shown but in a similar manner there are multiple alternatives are possible for instance in this case we may select uh, the option of separating propylene uh, but not methane similarly there could be another option where uh, we are separating methane but not propylene so there are multiple options are there and with respect to all these alternate routes one has to see which route is viable by using the cost calculation so once once the route is represented as a uh, uh, process flow sheet like this then the material and energy balance is performed and for this preliminary material and energy balance the preliminary uh, calculations can be performed to find out the cost and if the cost comes out to be uh, reasonable and if the cost if the profit is outweighing the cost in that case one can go with the given design for further refinement so similar to the alternate route in terms of the uh, the the feed of the reactant uh, the alternate routes can be represented if the process flow sheet is represented in the form of task so in this particular slide you can see that the entire flow sheet is represented in the uh, in the terms of task for instance if i look at this particular flow sheet here you can see that the water and ethylene is compressed and then heated before it is charged to the reactor so here the task could be increase the pressure increase the temperature so that is what is shown here you can see change in p change in t so this is with respect to let's say uh, ethylene similarly with respect to water change in p change in t with respect to water and both of these are then mix mixed here after that this mixture is charged to the reactor where uh, change in the space is taking place so reaction is occurring and because of that the new components are formed so change in the space is the next task uh, then then the product coming out from the uh, uh, the reactor is then uh, exchanges heat with the uh, water to to uh, 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 to recover the heat generated during the reaction so for that change in p and change in t will be performed in the flash unit as well as in the heat exchanger and finally uh, the product cooled product stream is then uh, separated in the distillation column to remove uh, the product as well as the waste products so uh, you can see that the entire flow sheet which we have shown here is converted to a converted to a another uh, diagram in the form of task so now now if we represent the given flow sheet in the form of task then we we have several alternatives present here for instance what should be the range of p what should be the range of uh, t all these changes is going to give us the large number of alternatives possible and based on all these alternatives uh, one has to select the best alternative which can give uh, the highest profitability 
so uh, similar to the task uh, again the process system can be the system can be represented in the form of heat exchanger so remember in this case some streams are losing the heat some streams are gaining the heat and if we represent uh, the temperature as well as the heat flow uh, for the entire system uh, we can actually find out what is the uh, lowest amount of utilities required for the process and that is very important because the amount of utility will incur the cost so so uh, such representation is also useful to find out the best alternative possible again again not just in terms of the temperature and the heat but also in terms of the composition uh, we can represent a, represent the entire system uh, in terms of change in the composition and one of such um, uh, representation is a mechathelia diagram isn't it so where where we can find out which will be the feed tray etc okay so clearly such representation can give different alternatives and not just the alternatives but also very often it gives what type of equipment can be used for a particular separation task so uh, once this is done then then once the different alternatives are uh, uh, generated then then one has to uh, assess the results with respect to all these alternatives and based on that we have to select the the best alternative among the possible alternative so here we can assess the results in terms of different criteria the first criteria is the economic evaluation so in the economic evaluation a preliminary design requires establishing the cost of the equipment and the cost associated with purchasing the utilities these methods assume that mass and energy balances have been completed and once this is done then then we are going to select a particular preliminary design which is giving the Uh, the lowest cost the next uh, next assessing criteria is the environmental regulation so it emphasizes the uh, importance of complying with the various government regulations related to air water and land uh, pollution the next assessing uh, criteria is a safety analysis so highlights the necessity of conducting the hazop studies to identify and mitigate the process standards in order to make the given process safe operationally then process flexibility this is a very important uh, criteria primarily because uh, if you look at the chemical processes chemical processes get modified over its lifetime so uh, depending on the dynamic conditions present outside so uh, need for processes to adapt to variations in input and operating conditions using uh, and and the classic example here is the petroleum refinery where uh, the feed from different location can come in sometimes the prices or demand are varying significantly in such dynamic environment whether the process is going to uh, adapt uh, will be able to adapt or not is important factor uh, the last assessing factor is a controllability so uh, clearly Uh, it addresses the challenges of maintaining process stability during dynamic changes and disturbances as i said very often what happens is uh, if you if you take a example of crude oil um, uh, fractionation so sometimes the 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 crude oil arrival get delayed sometimes sometimes you can see that the pump failure is there so because of that some tank is unavailable for feeding the uh, distillation unit sometimes uh, a particular distillation unit has some problem isn't it so uh, in such cases in such dynamic environment whether the process is stable or not okay so that is that is referred as a controllability so uh, Uh, next we are going to look at how we can generate the uh, uh, process flow sheet how we can synthesize the process flow sheet in a systematic manner we stop here thank you